morning, good day, wherever you are. Welcome to Biblical Quests. We are a worldwide scripture study community seeking to fulfill Yah's commandments to his followers to meditate on the Torah day and night so that we may be like a tree planted by streams of water that gives its fruit in its season so all that we do will prosper. This is week 24 of our 52-week cycle of chronological reading through the Torah, Prophets, and Yeshua's words, reminding you that we are currently going through year one which means that today the deep dive will be on the Torah portion in Exodus. The reading and open discussion will explore several sources, in particular the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Septuagint, and the Hebrew-English Masoretic. Where relevant, we will also explore extra-canonical books as found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. We are humbled and excited to share this journey with you all. Let us pray. Father Yah, we give thanks and praise to your great name. May your spirit be with us. May you speak through us, Father with what we have researched, with what you have guided us to show. May it be a blessing to all those who hear or watch. And may each person seek your face, seek to know you more intimately, and follow and obey your ways. May they be blessed in this, we ask in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. Welcome everyone. Quick reminder that I dropped the PDF for tonight's study in the recordings channel. This is our master schedule and as you can see this week's portion includes chapters from Exodus, Jeremiah and Luke. We are going to deep dive on the Torah portion and we highly recommend that you would read the Prophets and Yeshua portions at your own leisure. Today we are going to dive into chapter 35 through 37 of Exodus. And we will play through chapter 35, 36, and 37, and then we will go to commentary. This is Exodus chapter 35. And Moses assembled all the community of the Israelites, and he said to them, These are the words that Yahweh has commanded for us to do them. On six days work can be done, and on the seventh there will be for you a holy day, a Sabbath of complete rest for Yahweh. Anyone doing work on it will be put to death. You will not kindle a fire in any of your dwellings on the day of the Sabbath. And Moses said to all the community of the Israelites, saying, This is the word that Yahweh has commanded, saying, Take from among you a contribution for Yahweh, any one willing of heart. Let him bring Yahweh's contribution, gold and silver and bronze, and blue and purple and crimson yarns, and fine linen and goat hair, and red dyed ram skins, and fine leather, and acacia wood, and oil for the lamp, balsam oils for the anointing oil and for the fragrant incense, onyx stones and stones for mountings on the ephod and the breast piece. And let all the skilled of heart among you come and make all that Yahweh has commanded, the tabernacle, its tent, and its covering, its clasps and its frames, its bars, its pillars, and its bases, the ark and its poles, the atonement cover and the curtain of the screen, the table and its poles and all its equipment, and the bread of the presence, and lampstand of the light and its equipment and its lamps, and the oil for the light, and the altar of incense and its poles, and the anointing oil and the fragrant incense, and the entrance curtain for the entrance of the tabernacle, the altar of the burnt offering and the bronze grating that is for it, its poles and all its equipment, the basin and its stand, the hangings of the courtyard, its pillars and its bases, and the screen for the courtyard gate, the pegs of the tabernacle and the pegs of the courtyard and their cords, the woven garments for serving in the sanctuary, the holy garments for Aaron the priest and the garments of his sons to serve as priests. And all the community of the Israelites went out from before Moses. And they came, every man whose heart lifted him and every man whose spirit impelled him. They brought Yahweh's contribution for the work of the tent of assembly and for all its service and for the holy garments. And they came, the men in addition to the women, all who were willing of heart. They brought brooches and jewelry rings and signet rings and ornaments, every variety of gold object, every man who waved a wave offering of gold for Yahweh, and every man with whom was found blue and purple and crimson yarns and fine linen and goat hair and red dyed ram skins and fine leather brought it. All who were presenting a contribution of silver and bronze brought Yahweh's contribution, and all with whom was found acacia wood for all the work of service brought it. And every woman who was skilled of heart with her hands they spun, and they brought yarn, the blue and the purple, the crimson and the fine linen, and all the women whose heart lifted them with skill spun the goat hair, and the leaders brought the onyx stones and stones for mountings for the ephod and for the breast piece, and the balsam oils and the oil for light and for the anointing oil and for the fragrant incense. Every man and woman whose heart impelled them to bring for all the work to be done that Yahweh had commanded by the agency of Moses, the Israelites brought freely to Yahweh. 
And Moses said to the Israelites, See, Yahweh has called by name Bezalel the son of Uri the son of Hur, from the tribe of Judah, and he has filled him with the Spirit of God, with wisdom and with skill and with knowledge and with every kind of craftsmanship, and to devise designs, to work with the gold and with the silver and with the bronze, and in stone cutting for setting and in cutting wood, for doing every kind of design craftsmanship. And he has put it in his heart to teach, he and Oholab the son of Ahasamach, from the tribe of Dan. He has filled them with skill of heart to do every work of a craftsman and a desire, and an embroiderer with the blue and with the purple, with the crimson yarns and with the fine linen and a weaver. They are doers of every kind of craftsmanship and devisers of designs. This is Exodus chapter 36. And Bezil and Oholab and everyone who is skilled of heart in whom Yahweh has put wisdom and skill to know and to do all the work for the service of the sanctuary, they will do it according to all that Yahweh has commanded. And Moses called Bezil and Oholab and everyone skilled of heart in whose heart Yahweh had put skill, all whose heart lifted him to come near to the work in order to do it. And they took from Moses all the contributions that the Israelites had brought for the work of the service for the sanctuary in order to do it. And they still brought to him voluntary offerings every morning. And all the skilled workers who were doing all the work for the sanctuary came, each from his work that they were doing. And they said to Moses, saying, The people are bringing more than enough for the service of the work that Yahweh has commanded to be done. And Moses commanded, and they proclaimed the message in the camp, saying, Let no man or woman again make anything for the sanctuary contribution. And so the people were restrained from bringing, and the material was enough for doing all the work, and it was left over, and all who were skilled of heart among the doers of the work made the tabernacle with ten curtains of finely twisted linen and blue and purple and crimson yarns, with cherubim, he made them, the work of a skilled craftsman. The length of the one curtain was twenty-eight cubits, and the width was four cubits for the one curtain. One measurement was for all the curtains, and he joined five of the curtains one to another, and five curtains he joined one to another, and he made loops of blue on the edge of the one curtain, at the end and the set, so he did on the edge of the end curtain and the second set. He made fifty loops on the one curtain, and he made fifty loops on the end of the curtain that was in the second set. The loops were opposite one to another, and he made fifty gold clasps and joined the curtains one to another with the clasps, so that the tabernacle was one, and he made curtains of goat hair for a tent over the tabernacle. He made them eleven curtains. The length of the one curtain was thirty cubits, and the width was four cubits for the one curtain. One measure was for the eleven curtains, and he joined five curtains together and six curtains together, and he made fifty loops on the edge of the end curtain in the set, and he made fifty loops on the edge of the curtain in the second set. And he made fifty bronze clasps for joining the tent to become one. And he made a covering for the tent of red dyed ram skin and a covering of fine leather to go above. And he made the frames for the tabernacle of acacia wood as uprights. The length of the frame was ten cubits, and the width of the one frame was one and a half cubits. He made two pegs for the one frame for joining one to another and likewise for all the frames of the tabernacle. And he made the frames for the tabernacle with twenty frames for the south side. And he made forty silver bases under the twenty frames, with two bases under the one frame for its two pegs, and two bases under the next frame for its two pegs. And for the second side of the tabernacle, the north side, he made twenty frames, and there forty silver bases, with two bases under the one frame and two bases under the next frame. And for the rear of the tabernacle on the west he made six frames, and he made two frames for the tabernacle corners at the rear, and they were double at the bottom, and they were completely together on its top to the one ring. He did likewise for the two of them, for the two quarters. And there were eight frames and their sixteen silver bases, two bases, two bases under the one frame. And he made five bars of acacia wood for the frames on the one side of the tabernacle, and five bars for the frames on the second side of the tabernacle, and five bars for the frames at the rear on the west. And he made the middle bar to run in the midst of the frames from end to end. And he overlaid the frames with gold, and he made their rings of gold as holders for the bars. And he overlaid the bars with gold. And he made the curtain of blue and purple and crimson yarns and finely twisted linen, the work of a craftsman. He made it with cherubim, and he made for it four acacia pillars, and he overlaid them with gold, with their gold hooks, and he cast for them four silver bases. And he made for the entrance of the tent a screen of blue and purple and crimson yarns and finely twisted linen, the work of an embroiderer, and the five pillars and their hooks, and he overlaid their tops and their connections with gold, and their five bases were bronze. Okay, so before we continue, I just wanted to draw your attention to amount of uh, orange color that you are seeing here. So the chapters in the Septuagint does not match the chapter in, in the Masoretic. It's completely out of order. I couldn't even make sense out of here. 
so I just want you to know that I think that from what I see later the description that we see here is described in another chapter in the Septuagint. Everything is out of order when it comes to the actual building of the tabernacle and preparation of the garments, the garments. Two more things that I wanted to remind you is that every time bronze or brass, it's actually copper. Okay, it's copper in Hebrew. It's not bronze and it's not brass. It's copper. And then every time in English blue, it's not dark blue. It's actually a specific blue called sky blue. Okay, trellet. So I just want to make sure that you start reframing the color in your mind whenever you think about the priestly garments and the tabernacle. It's a very light type of blue. So we can continue. This is Exodus chapter 37. And Bezil made the ark of acacia wood, two and a half cubits its length and a cubit and a half its width and a cubit and a half its height. And he overlaid it with pure gold inside and outside. And he made for it a gold molding all around. And he cast for it four gold rings on its four feet, and two rings were on its one side, and two rings were on its second side. And he made poles of acacia wood, and he overlaid them with gold. And he put the poles into the rings on the sides of the ark to carry the ark. And he made an atonement cover of pure gold, two and a half cubits its length and a cubit and a half its width. And he made two cherubim of gold. He made them of hammered work at the two ends of the atonement cover. One cherub was at one end, and one cherub was at the other end of the atonement cover. He made the cherubim at its two ends. And the cherubim were without spread wings above, covering with their wings over the atonement cover and facing each other. The faces of the cherubim were toward the atonement cover. And he made the table of acacia wood, two cubits its length and a cubit its width and a cubit and a half its height. And he overlaid it with pure gold, and he made for it a gold molding all around. And he made for it a handbreadth rim all around, and he made a gold molding for its rim all around. And he cast for it four gold rings, and he put the rings on the four corners where its four legs were. The rings were near the rim as holders for the poles to carry the table. And he made the poles of acacia wood, and he overlaid them with gold to carry the table. And he made the vessels that were on the table, its plates and its ladles, and its bowls and its pitchers with which libations were poured, of pure gold. And he made the lampstand of pure gold, he made the lampstand of hammered work, its base and its branch, its cups, its buds, and its blossoms were all part of it. And six branches were going out from its sides, three branches of the lampstand from its one side and three branches of the lampstand from its second side. Three almond flower cups were on the one branch with a bud and a blossom, and three almond flower cups were on the one branch with a bud and a blossom. Likewise for the six branches going out from the lampstand, and on the lampstand were four almond flower cups, with its buds and its blossoms. And a bud was under the two branches that came from it, and a bud under the two branches from it, and a bud under the two branches from it. Likewise for the six branches coming out from the lampstand, their buds and their branches were from it, all of it one piece of pure gold, hammered work. And he made it seven lamps, and its snuffers, and its fire pans of pure gold. He made it from a talent of pure gold and all its pieces of equipment. And he made the incense altar of acacia wood, a cubit its length and a cubit its width, a square, and two cubits its height. Its horns were of one piece with it. And he overlaid it with pure gold, its top and its sides all around and its horns. And he made for it a gold molding all around. And he made for it two gold rings under its molding on two opposite sides as holders for poles to carry it with them. And he made the poles of acacia wood, and he overlaid them with gold. And he made the holy anointing oil and the pure fragrant incense, work of a perfumer. Thoughts and insights. These three chapters were mostly rehash of all of the instructions that we went through last week. So we didn't have a lot of comments about most of the rehash, but both of us came up with a few things to share with you. So let's start. So yeah, I'll start with the willing heart, and I'm extracting this from... Exodus 35, 5. Take from among you a contribution for Yahweh. Anyone willing of heart, let him bring Yahweh's contribution. And we have read in Exodus 25, 2. Speak to the Israelites and let them bring to me a contribution. You will receive my contribution from every man whose heart prompts him. So there's a willingness of heart that is in people to serve and to do the will of Yah. And in Psalms 51, 10, and 12, 
Create a clean heart for me, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and with a willing spirit sustain me. So we see a willing heart is pretty much the same thing as a willing spirit. And he's asking to restore the joy of your salvation when you're reading here in Psalms, when you read the whole story of what David's talking about. But the willing spirit is like a willing heart to do the Father's will. And then I want to speak further on the heart, specifically in Psalms 51, 17. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and repentant heart. So it's combining this broken spirit and a broken, repentant heart. And it very well may be one and the same when you're talking about a broken spirit is related to a broken, repented heart. Because God will not despise that. And also notice that when we have a broken spirit, a repentant heart, that's a sacrifice of God. He considers that a sacrifice. We are repenting, we're turning away from our old ways, and we are having a broken spirit, meaning our spirit is turned over to him instead of it being ours to rule and run with. So that's a sacrifice, and I think that's pretty obvious, and that's shown as a sacrifice to Yah. Psalms 49.3, my mouth will speak wisdom and the meditation of my heart discernment. And this also is part of how we are to operate. If our mouth is going to speak wisdom, we must be meditating on discernment and understanding things. And as you read Proverbs and you read other places in Sirach, you'll get a better understanding about wisdom how to obtain her, and also how to operate with wisdom. And I'll touch on wisdom some more. But next I want to talk about the craftsman's glory. And I haven't seen anyone do a study on this, and so I wanted to bring it out regarding Exodus 35, 31. And he has filled him with the Spirit of God, with wisdom and with discernment and with knowledge and with every kind of craftsmanship. With our craftsmanship and skills that we have, We are to focus on the law of the covenant above all. If not, we will fall in the trap of glorifying our craft and idolizing it and forfeiting wisdom. These people here were given wisdom, discernment, knowledge with every kind of craftsmanship. But there's also a warning about the craftsmanship's glory. And I'll speak to that in Sirach 38, 24 to 34. The wisdom of the scribe increases wisdom, and he who has little business can be wise. How can he, now we're going to start talking about the craftsmen, those who are craftsmen, how can he who holds the plow become wise, who glories in brandishing the ox goad, who leads cattle and turns about oxen, and whose discourse is with bullocks? He sets his heart on turning his furrows, and his anxiety is to have sufficient fodder. Likewise, the engraver and craftsman, who passes his time by night and by day, they cut engravings of signets, and his diligence is to make variety. He sets his heart to make his likeness true, and his anxiety is to finish his work. So the blacksmith, sitting by the anvil, And considering the unwrought iron, the vapor of the fire cracks his flesh, and in the heat of the furnace he glows. The sound of the hammer is continually in his ear, and his eyes are upon the pattern of the vessel. He sets his heart upon finishing his works, and his diligence is to adorn them perfectly. So the potter sits at his work, and turning about the wheel with his feet, who is ever anxiously set at his work, and all his handiwork is by number. With his arm he fashions the clay, and he bends its strength before his feet, and he applies his heart to finish the glazing, and his diligence is to clean the furnace. All these, all of these craftsmen that I just mentioned, that I just read, all of these rely on their hands, and each is wise in his handiwork. Without them, a city cannot be inhabited, and they do not sojourn, neither do they walk up and walk down. But in the council of the people, they are not sought for, 
And in the assembly, they will not be exalted. They will not sit on the seat of the judge. And they will not be able to understand the covenant of judgment. Neither will they expound the righteousness and judgment. And among rulers, they will not be found. However, the fabric of the world they will maintain, and their thoughts are on the handiwork of their craft. These verses are talking about, this is heart, anxiety to finish, anxiety to do. Diligence is, their heart is to finish. And they are consumed by the handiwork of their skill in the work that they're doing, and their focus is not on the covenant, not on the commands in that sense. It's telling us that people who just do that, they will not be among the rulers, they will not be found, and they will not understand the covenant of judgment because they are glorifying in their own skill, in their own works. And that is where their glory resides. However, the fabric of the world they will maintain. Correct. So they still have a role and importance. They do, so, and uh, because of yeah. the glory they get, that's why it continues. In contrast, I want to speak in the next chapter of Sirach in 39, verses 1 through 11, about the praise of wisdom. So now it's going to talk about wisdom. Not so to he who gives his soul and meditates in the law of the Most High. So now it's comparing the craftsmen to now those who are meditating in the law of the Most High. He searches out the wisdom of all the ancients and is occupied in prophecies. He preserves the discourses of men of renown and enters into refinements of parables. He seeks out the hidden things of Proverbs and is conversant with the obscure things of parables. He serves among great men and appears before a ruler. He travels in the land of alien nations and he has tried both good and evil things among men. He applies his heart to rise up early to the Lord who made him. Before the Most High, he makes supplication, and opens his mouth in prayer, and makes supplication for his sins. If the great Lord is willing, he will be filled with the spirit of understanding. He himself pours forth words of wisdom, and gives thanks to the Lord in prayer. He himself directs his counsel and knowledge, and in the secrets of it he meditates. He himself declares the instruction of his teaching, and glories in the law of the covenant of the Lord. Many praise his understanding, never will it be blotted out. His memorial will not cease, and his name will live to generations of generations. His wisdom will be the Gentiles declare, and his praise will be the congregation tell forth. If he continues, he will be counted greater than a thousand, and if he dies, he will become more renowned. Obviously, comparing both, we want to strive to have the wisdom for it is a spirit of understanding, and it's all tied in with meditating on the laws of the Most High and glorying in the law of the covenant of the Lord. Those are the two key things mentioned here when it's relating to the wisdom. And in that wisdom, what is that person doing? Instead of being a craftsman where he's pouring his heart and also his focus on the hand skills and so forth, the person with wisdom is putting forth energy and effort in the prophecies, the parables, the laws of the Most High, and conversing on these things and meditating on these things and so forth. I just want to point out the differences in how we see people today. We all have a job to do to exist and pay our bills, etc., and we are to not let that be who we are. We are not let that to be our, where our energy, all of our energy is. We are to do the job, get it done, and then we are to focus on the laws of the Most High and meditate upon them, just as we said in the beginning of this, this study. Next, I want to talk about wisdom only dwells in the house of Israel. Luke 19.10, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save those who are lost. Luke 5.32, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repent. This is Yeshua. Matthew 15, 24, Yeshua answered, I wasn't sent to anyone but the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, this is speaking about the people of Israel, not the land of Israel. He was, he was there for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Yeshua is only coming back for the lost sheep. He said so. 
And then in Sirach 24.8, Then the creator of all things gave me, and this is wisdom speaking here, a commandment. And he that created me made my tabernacle to rest and said, Let your tabernacle be in Jacob and your inheritance in Israel. So we see the creator gave a commandment to wisdom to be, to rest in Jacob, in Israel. So we know that wisdom is with the house of Israel, those who are walking in obedience and believing in Yeshua and Yahweh. So I wanted to bring that out and show that. Next, I want to point out Michael's role. Michael's known as the angel protector of Israel. In Daniel 12, 1 and then in 10, 21, it, it gives us this information. Now at that time, Michael, the great prince, will arise, the protector over the sons of your people. And it will be a time of distress that has not been since your people have been a nation until that time. However, I will tell you what is inscribed in the book of truth. And there is not one who contends with me against these things except Michael your prince. Michael is the prince, and if you recall reading about the sons of God, the angels being over regions or peoples in like a governance, so to speak, that they're called princes, and Michael being the prince over the house of Israel. Just wanted to mention that, if you did not know that. Then I'm going to move over to the lamp is a commandment, and the light is the Torah. And I want to reference this to the ten virgins and their lamps with oil parable. Five were called wise out of those ten. And that was in Matthew 25. They were wise because they brought extra oil in preparedness. And we'll read some verses from Proverbs 2020. He who curses his father and his mother, his lamp will be extinguished in the midst of darkness. 13.9 The light of the righteous will rejoice but the lamp of the wicked will die out, 2420. For there will not be a future for the evil. The lamp of the wicked will die out, Matthew 6:22. The eye is the lamp of the body. Therefore, if your eye is sincere, your whole body will be full of light. And so I, I wanted to mention that when we talked about the ten virgins and those who had oil and others who did not bring enough oil, to wait it out, we, we, we went over this already, and they, they weren't serious. They just weren't serious. And we get another hint here with Proverbs 2020, those who curse his father and his mother, his lamp will be extinguished in the midst of darkness. So I think this may be another clue of these five foolish virgins. They obviously didn't take it serious. We already talked about that. And it looks like they, they may have cursed the father and or mother if you want to take that figuratively with the Father and wisdom and look at that so that their lamps were extinguished in the midst of darkness. I thought that was a, a possible tie-in to the ten virgins referencing that as another reason why they were foolish because obviously it says the light of the righteous will rejoice but the lamp of the wicked will die out. So there may also have been some type of wickedness that was not repented of, turned over, and moved from in their lives. And lastly, I wanted to bring up the everlasting commandments are the ways of wisdom. In Sirach 1, 5, the word of Yah Most High is the fountain of wisdom, and her ways are everlasting commandments. So wisdom is tied into the everlasting commandments, and it, it even says it's her ways. When you study out wisdom, you will see a greater picture of, of the role of wisdom and the benefits and what wisdom actually does in our lives and, what, and why we are to pray for the Father to grant us wisdom. I truly believe that those who are true to their faith, true in their walk and belief, will have wisdom residing in their life because it is a spirit that is tied in with the, the commandments and with Yahweh himself as we have read in Proverbs and also Sirach. And in Proverbs 6, 20 to 24, My child, keep the commandment of your father, and do not disregard the instruction of your mother. And that word for instruction is also translated as Torah, teachings, ordinances, and law for that. 
so I, I thought that was very interesting that there's a father-mother scenario here when it talks about keeping the commandment of your father and do not disregard the instruction or Torah of your mother. And we just read up in Sirach 1, 5, wisdom has her ways are everlasting commandments, which are tied in with the Torah. Bind them on your heart continually, and that's what we are to do. Tie them up around your neck. When you walk, she will lead you. When you lie down, she will watch over you. And when you awake, she will converse with you. For the lamp is a commandment, and instruction is light. And the way of life is the reproof of discipline. The way of life is the reproof of discipline. Many people fail in this area. It's the lack of discipline to keep their lamp lit, to be in the commands, and to have the instructions as the light of leading their way in their life. In order to preserve you from the evil woman, from the smoothness of the tongue of an adulteress. And we obviously know that also would mean idolatry and or other gods. And so that's what I wanted to finish with. The everlasting commands are the ways of wisdom. So what I did here was talked about the willing heart, the craftsman glory, and then more into wisdom and how the wisdom is our benefit and what we are to do with wisdom. That's what I got out of chapter 35 when I jumped on the wisdom, knowledge, and discernment with the craftsman. So that's what I pulled out of it. Okay, thank you. Both of us were uh, attracted to the same topic. So let's move to mine. Okay. I was, my attention was captured by verse 35, 31 also. And what I noticed as I was looking at different English translation is that there is a huge salad out there of translations and many of them are missing the nuances between seven concepts in Hebrew. So this verse discusses wisdom, discernment and knowledge. But when you look in the Old Testament in general, there are seven concepts that fall under the umbrella. And I think I reached the end of my rope with the salad that I saw, so I decided to methodically organize everything so I can help you get more insights when you do the readings and use a little bit more discernment <laughs> as you go through the different terms. In biblical language, there are seven concepts related to knowledge. Each of them has a unique meaning. In this week's rabbit hole, I am going to explore the meaning of these seven concepts through the book of, mostly the book of Proverbs. There are 915 verses in the book of Proverbs. Each verse is loaded with wisdom and can literally be a title of a book. Solomon did not have time to write so many books. He was too busy appeasing 1,000 women. But by looking at the verses, one can try and understand what would have been written in those 915 books if Solomon had written them. The commentary provided next is the tip of the proverbial iceberg. I hope that some of you will be inspired to dive deeper and study the rest of the iceberg. So what I'm going to do, since we have time, I'm going to pause between each concept to take comments inside questions before I move on to the next one. Okay, so we have seven concepts. Wisdom, in Hebrew, chokhmah, represent, in the Bible, it represents the talent to hear, learn, and teach, especially in the spiritual field. Discernment. In Hebrew, tvuna or bina, the ability to think, reason, and draw conclusions. Knowledge, in Hebrew, da'at, this represents experiential grasping or expertise through the senses. Cunning, in the Bible, or ma, the talent to tempt and deceive and be aware of the of deception the fifth concept understanding insight common sense intelligence it i had a hard time translating it into english it could mean 
either one of those or all of them, okay? Understanding, insight, common sense, intelligence. Usually the word that you will see is his skill, but there will be derivative from that root. This represents the talent to make the right choice and succeed, especially in the material realm. The sixth concept, conspiracy or plot, mezima in Hebrew, the talent to harm. And the seventh concept, resourcefulness or ingenuity, in Hebrew, tushia, the talent to plan and deliver help. So let's start. Wisdom. In the book of Proverbs, wisdom is usually associated with the heart, the seat of thoughts. In many verses, wisdom is related to learning, hearing, and ears. Wisdom is also the talent to speak and teach. In other verses, wisdom is related to speech and the mouth. Proverbs 2.6 for Yahweh will give wisdom. From his mouth comes knowledge and discernment. Proverbs 32 3. Certainly I am more stupid than a man, and the understanding of humankind is not for me. And I have not learned wisdom, nor will I know knowledge of the Holy One. Proverbs 15.2 the tongue of the wise will dispense knowledge, but the mouth of fools will pour out folly. Proverbs 18.15 An intelligent mind will acquire knowledge, and the ear of the wise will seek knowledge. Proverbs 9.10 The start of wisdom is fear of Yahweh, and knowledge of the Holy One, insight. For uh, several of the concepts, I am introducing a self-test, okay, that can help you understand even more what Proverbs is teaching about, and, and the Bible in general, about each concept. So, but I, I did, I created the self-test only for a few of the concepts. So, self-test number one, am I wise? So there are a few questions that we can ask ourselves. The first one is, do I like to hear advice from others? Proverbs 12:15. The way of a fool is upright in his own eyes, but he who listens to advice is wise. Meaning, the fool is sure that the path he is walking is straight and without obstacles and ignores the advice of others. However, those who listen to the advice of others gain another perspective on the path they are following and become wiser. Am I interested in hearing criticism from others? Proverbs 15.31 The ear of him who listens to admonitions of life, in the midst of the wise it will lodge. Meaning, a person who is willing to incline his ear and hear criticism about life will be entitled to dwell among the wise, even if he is not wise himself. Do I love those who criticize me, even when they are full? Proverbs 9.8 Do not rebuke, criticize a jester, lest he hate you. Rebuke, criticize the wise, and he will love you. Meaning, there is no point in criticizing a jester because he will not listen but will only hate the critique. Instead, you should criticize the wise one because he will love you. Hence, the wise, the one who knows how to learn, knows how to draw constructive and useful conclusions from any criticism, and therefore he loves every person who criticizes him. When I criticize another person, do I try to make him feel good and successful despite the criticism? Proverbs 25.12 A ring of gold and an ornament of fine gold is a rebuke of the wise to the ear of a listener. 
meaning like a golden ring that adorns the nose so a wise critic knows how to adorn the ear that hears his rebuke presenting his words of criticism as compliments and as ornaments to the personality of the listener do i tend to learn from everyone with humility and guarding myself from words of pride Proverbs 14.3 In the mouth of a fool is the rod of pride, but the lips of the wise preserve them. Meaning, a fool, shallow person speaks prideful, eye-handed, and vicious words. However, wise people speak with humility, and their lips protect them from the harm of aggression. Next. Do I try to formulate my words in a concise and clear way? Proverbs 15.2 The tongue of the wise will dispense knowledge, but the mouth of fools will pour out folly. Meaning, when the wise speak their mind, their language is concise, enriching, and ameliorating. But when the foolish speak their words of folly, their mouths open like a gushing spring and pour forth nonsense without restraint. Am I able to improve things I learned from others and teach them to others in a more beneficial way? Proverbs 15.7 The lips of the wise will spread knowledge, but the heart of fools not meaning. The wise absorb, reflect, and expand on what they learned from others, but the foolish despise and reject the opinions of others. Am I ready to go out on the street and convince people to come study Yah's word? Proverbs 1, 20-21 Wisdom calls out in the streets, in the square, she raises her voice. On a busy corner, she cries out at the entrances of the gates. In the city, she speaks her sayings. Meaning, wise women and men by nature like to sit at home and study. However, according to the book of Proverbs, they should actually go out into the street and teach. Am I able to mediate between people who are quarreling, make them listen to each other and thus calm their anger? Proverbs 29.8 Men of scoffing set a city aflame, but the wise turn away wrath. Meaning, fools scoffers stalk the fire of anger and discord until the community burns and turns to soot. But the wise who knows how to listen and learn from others calm down and put out the fire of anger. So before I continue, I'll just have a pause and see if anyone has any thoughts, any inspirations from what I just shared about what wisdom is in the Bible, especially through the book of Proverbs. I want to mention that you positioning these in, in questions for questioning yourself, I think is really a great thing to do. This way you're actually re referencing the proverb that you're pulling the question out of and letting us read that to ask ourselves, are we doing yes, this? Yes, exactly. A good measurement for us to see how, quote, wise are we in our lives and where can we improve yes. just by taking this self-test. That's I, I think it's excellent. Thank you. Yeah, I felt that was good for me personally because it's a reminder that I need to check myself in those areas and see where I can improve. And then if you have a spouse, you can have your spouse answer it for you. Yes. <laughs> see, see if you're wise exactly. enough. Exactly. <laughs> Any comments from anyone? I would agree. I think that it's really good to self-test to do because as you're reading it, I was questioning myself okay where am I at in some of these things and obviously there's some things that I would definitely say that I'm not up to par on for sure 
and that I think it is a really good self-test to ask if you are wise because I think it's really a great way to self-evaluate where am I in my own wisdom and how wise do we really walk because I think it's hard to self-criticize for yourself to say okay where am I at in the word or how do I handle myself with people and I always would think to myself oh it would be good if someone could do like anonymously if people know you to put things down on paper to criticize you to figure out because people are not always going to be truthful I think to you to your face but I think (laughs) if they did anonymously like a piece of paper or something to help you see where you're falling short in yourself I think that it in some ways with your spouse it would be a little bit more unfair because I don't know maybe they would criticize you even more (laughs) I don't know in that one but I would well done I think it was well done and I definitely took note on some of these things and think okay where are some of these areas that I need to pull up my socks in yeah exactly and for me I actually, when I was going through those questions, I was thinking, wow, this is a trait of Rob, and I, it helped me understand, because there are things that we are different, right? So there are things that might sometimes irritate me, and all of a sudden I'm thinking, oh my God, this is wisdom. <laughs> I shouldn't be irritated <laughs> when he does this. So I, I don't know, I learned a lot from this exercise. Yeah, I was thinking about the one that hit with me about going out in the streets and I would just so not, that is just so not me to go out into the streets. Like I can be, I'm, I'm bold with at work and my co-workers and stuff like that, but to go out actually into the street, but I've been feeling a little bit convicted about this a little bit lately, just in my area, just really acknowledging people that are on the streets and that might be begging or something like that. And I felt yeah. like y'all was speaking to me about saying that silver and gold Nora have to give but I can give you a word of of Christ and give them like a word of wisdom and I've just been really feeling like that and so when you talked about going out into the streets I felt like it really hit home for me in that area because I've already been feeling like that for the last couple months because a lot of times we'll for myself I'll just walk by and just you get tired of the begging and I know that might not bode well with some people but you just there's just so much drugs and people on the street and and I'm just trying to be honest in my thought process here and as you're walking past them and I just you felt really convicted of that and because it's I really shouldn't be looking at oh they're just wanting money and stuff because to give them money for drugs or whatever or I used to give them stuff or buy them whatever but I feel like it's more important to give them the word of Yah and that's what I've been feeling Mm. it's rather than just even if it's just a smile just to to let them know that you're acknowledging them that they are a person and that they are important to God and to say Yah loves you and he sees I do pray for them as I walk but I feel like that particular one kind of hit more home to me than the rest of them but anyways but thank you for that (laughs) Donna thank you I wanted to say that that question, am I ready to go out on the street? Proverbs 1, 20 through 21. I mostly read Proverbs in English. So when I read it in Hebrew this time, I was shocked to find out that actually it's not singular. It's not wisdom. It actually in Hebrew, it says wisdoms call out in the streets. Wisdoms. And if you look at the word, if that word, if you remove the, what is called nikud, the pronunciation, and it just you just look at the letters without nikud, it could be read in two different ways. Either it says wisdoms, plural of wisdom, or it says wise women. Okay, so that's interesting. So it could be read, wise women call out in the streets. Okay, it's very interesting. I tried to find some more information about it and I saw that there are quite a bit of thoughts that were put into that peculiarity of plural wisdom in that verse in scholarly writings in Hebrew. I do need to read more to bring more, a little bit more knowledge on this, but I did find it very interesting that it's actually not singular, it's it's plural. Then I don't have to go out in the street. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, Don't go by yourself. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so I'm continuing next with discernment. Discernment, vuna or bina. 
okay so it's the ability to think reason and draw conclusions discernment is an internal process it is something that a person draws and brings out of his own heart as opposed to wisdom which he seeks and finds externally actually he wisdom is usually bestowed on a person from ya yeah. proverbs 18:15 a discerning heart will acquire knowledge, and the ear of the wise will seek knowledge. Proverbs 19.8 He who acquires heart, and remember heart is equal to wisdom. So he who acquires wisdom loves himself. He who guards discernment loves to find good. Proverbs 3.13, happy is the one who finds wisdom and one who obtains discernment. What I notice in English translation, most, more often than not, instead of the word discernment, they use the word understanding, and sometimes they use the word skill. Okay? Continuing, according to the book of Proverbs, wisdom is contained within discernment. Okay? <laughs> Let me say it again, wisdom is contained within discernment. In other words, a discerning person is inherently wise. However, Proverbs never mentions that a wise person is inherently discerning, which means that discernment is a more advanced talent than wisdom. So Proverbs 10.13, on the lips of one who has discernment, wisdom is found. But a rod is for the back of one who lacks heart, wisdom. Okay, who lacks wisdom. When a wise person who knows, what does it mean? When a wise person who knows how to investigate and draw conclusions opens his lips and speaks, words of wisdom are always there because he knows how to explain and reason. However, the heartless, one who does not know how to think logically, does not know how to reason, when he tries to explain things, he is forced to hit the back with a stick. In other words, a heartless person who does not know how to draw spiritual and mental resources from his heart does not know how to influence others in a positive way. And if he still wants to influence, he may behave in a dogmatic and a compulsive manner. Proverbs 14.33 In the heart of him who has discernment, wisdom rests. But even in the midst of fools, it becomes known. I, I will expand on this verse in the next slide. Proverbs 17.24 He who is discerning sets his face toward wisdom, but the eyes of a fool to the end of the earth. Again, I'll expand on this verse in the next slide. I have another self-test. Am I discerning or do I have discernment? Let's start. Do I feel that I need to announce and publicize my bits of wisdom at every opportunity? Proverbs 14.33 In the heart of him who has discernment, wisdom rests. But even in the midst of fool it becomes known. Meaning, the wisdom that is in the heart of a wise man is at rest. The wise man is confident in his wisdom and does not feel the need to bring it out and publish it constantly. However, the little wisdom that is in the midst of foolish people is not at rest. They feel that they must announce and publicize the little wisdom that they have at every opportunity. Is it easy for me to retrieve information from memory? Proverbs 14.6 A scoffer seeks wisdom, but there is none. But knowledge com comes easily to him who is discerning. When a fool who despises his studies asks for or searches in his memory a thing of wisdom that he learned in the past, he is unable to find it. However, 
when a wise person who thinks and draws conclusions from the things he learns looks for an idea he learned in the past, he easily recalls it. Do I try to find solutions to problems with the means at my disposal, even when they seem insufficient? Proverbs 17.24 he who is discerning sets his face toward wisdom, but the eyes of a fool to the end of the earth. Meaning, he who is discerning and knows how to observe sees wisdom wherever he turns and finds solution to problems with the help of the means at hand. But the fool turns his eyes away and claims that the solutions are only at the far end of the land. Another alternate meaning is, there are people from whom you can learn something in every conversation. They are always ready to talk about matters of wisdom and learning. Other, will, other people will always find an excuse why it is impossible to study. I don't have the energy, I don't have books, the atmosphere is not suitable, etc, etc. Proverbs obviously prefers the first type. Do I dare to investigate and carefully examine even rich people who consider themselves to be great sages? Proverbs 28.11 a man of wealth is wise in his, in his own eyes, but the discerning poor sees through him. Meaning, every rich man thinks he is wise and knows the secret of getting rich. However, a poor person does not buy these secrets before he thoroughly investigates the rich and determines whether his success is indeed due to wisdom. Or, an alternate meaning, not everyone who has succeeded in getting rich is necessarily wise, so we should investigate every rich person who thinks they are wise before we fall into their get-rich-quick scams. Do acts of wisdom come to me naturally? Proverbs 10.23 It is like a sport for a fool to do wrong. Wisdom for a person of discernment. There are things, meaning, there are things we do automatically, uncontrollably, or so it seems to us. According to Proverbs, even the things we do uncontrollably are the result of our choices. For a person who hates to learn, tasteless, obscene acts are a second nature. He does them automatically, uncontrollably, because he got used to living without restraints and without self-control. A wise person, on the other hand, does, does acts of wisdom automatically because he has already gotten used to living with wisdom. Do I need empty and meaningless things to make me happy? Proverbs 15.21 Folly is a joy to him who lacks heart. Remember, heart is wisdom. And the person of discernment will walk upright. Meaning, foolish jokes give joy to a person who lacks heart or intellect. But a wise man gets joy from following a straight path and has no need for foolish things to make him happy. Do I dare to investigate and carefully examine even rich people who consider themselves great sages? Proverbs 28.11 A man of wealth is wise in... Oh, I already read it. I think I already did that question. You Yes, you did. Yes, sorry. Okay, next. Do I try to save words so that I can think calmly about thing, the things I hear? Proverbs 17, 27. He who spares his sayings knows knowledge, and he that controls his spirit is a man of discernment. Meaning, in order to develop mentally and spiritually, a person needs to be silent. He needs to rest from talking and focus on listening instead. 
not only to others but also to himself or an alternate meaning he who is frugal with words and speaking gains a lot he knows more because he is free to listen to others he brings up more valuable and interesting ideas in his mind because he is free to listen to himself and he becomes a wise man because he is free to develop his own discernment continuing as you can see proverbs has a lot to say about discernment okay do i keep quiet when people insult me proverbs 11:12 he who lacks sense belittles his neighbor but a person of discernment will remain silent mm. meaning he who expresses contempt for his neighbor is heartless and a person of discernment doesn't reply but remains silent self restraint does not indicate weakness but rather it indicates intelligence or discernment when i think about a piece of news i heard and try to understand its meaning do i try to find out all the additional facts related to the subject so that my conclusions are grounded proverbs 15:14 the heart of him who is discerning seeks knowledge, but the mouth of fools will feed on folly. Meaning, the heart of a wise person always seeks to know the whole truth. The wise man exam examines the information in his heart before he publishes it. On the other hand, the mouth of foolish people likes to be associated with superficiality. They dispense superficial information without checking it. Note, the fool in Proverbs symbolizes the tendency to be foolish that is inherent in each one of us, which causes us to approach and love information that fits our worldview without a thorough examination. This verse teaches us to be aware of this tendency and keep it in check. We should always search and check the facts until we know them clearly, whether they agree with our worldview or not. Can I, from an analysis of the other person's actions, anticipate his next move? Can I, by looking at the other person's facial expression, know what he is planning to say? Proverbs 28.11 Deep waters are like purpose in the heart of a man, and a man of discernment will draw it out. Meaning, every person has thoughts and plans that are hidden like deep water and cannot be seen from the outside. But a wise person knows how to draw conclusions from facial expressions, tone of voice, body language, actions, and any other information he has about the person. And from this, a wise person may discern and anticipate that, that person's plans. Am I able to connect some ideas I have learned to create a new idea, like making a rope by twisting some threads, or basically connecting the dots? Proverbs 1.5 May the wise hear and increase learning, and the one who is discerning gain their direction. Meaning, learning never ends. Even the wise who has already learned a lot will listen to new words of wisdom and add practical lessons and understandings to himself. And the discerning man who has already researched and introduced new concepts will acquire new strategies. Okay, and the last question, am I able to manage an organization without employing a large number of sub-managers who cause the organization's money to be wasted? Or am I able to form a stable government with a small number of ministers? Proverbs 28.2, by the rebellion of a land, her rulers increase. But by a person of intelligence who knows justice, it will last. Because, meaning, because of the crimes of the inhabitants of the land, a large, cumbersome, and corrupt government arises. 
and thanks to a discerning person who knows which roles and responsibilities are necessary for efficiently running the country, a small and stable government will be established that will last for many days. Okay, so that's discernment. Those are the questions about discernment. Anyone has any thoughts or any questions or any insights from this concept? My first thought is, can you do all the Proverbs? <laughs> and put it in question format. I love that. <laughs> that was great. Yeah. So now we are in knowledge. So now we are touching on the third gift that Yah gave Bezalel, the artist, to create all the tabernacle accessories and the priestly garments. We are now at knowledge, Da'at. So it represents experiential grasping expertise through the senses. In today's jargon, knowledge is a collection of theoretical facts that a person grasps in his mind. However, from a biblical perspective, knowledge is an experiential, unmediated acquaintance with data or people, an acquaintance that may also be connected to affection and love. So let's look at it. Here I brought some other examples, not only proverbs. So the verb to know when it indicates a relationship between a man and a woman refers to the sexual act itself. See Genesis 4.1, Adam knew Eve, Genesis 19.8, when Lot offered his daughters to the gang outside the door and he told them they haven't known uh, men. In Genesis 24:16, Rebecca uh, was described as a young virgin, but instead of saying virgin, it said that she didn't know a man. In Judges 19:22, we have the horrific story of the concubine and the Levite, and the verb to know is used again as a sexual act. First Samuel. 119, Elkanah knew Hannah, and then she conceived and had Samuel. And 1 Kings 1 4, David, the story of David and Abishag, basically saying that David didn't know Abishag, she was just warming his bed, if mm -hmm. you remember that story. Okay, the words acquaintance and family member are derived from the word knowledge. In Hebrew, it will be moda or meyuda. So you can see examples of knowledge, the word acquaintance or family coming from the word knowledge. Uh, in 2 Kings 10 11, about the house of Ahab, Psalms, also I gave a few references from Psalms, Job, and Ruth. Also, there is the knowledge of Yah. A person who knows Yah is a person who is aware of the reality of Yah knows intimately the ways of behavior desired by Yah and behaves according to them. See Deuteronomy 4.39 and then I gave additional references from Psalms and First Chronicles. And when Yah works miracles, the whole world gets to know Him and knows Him closely. Sing praises to Yahweh, for he has done a glorious thing. This is known in all of the air. That's a verse from Isaiah. Yah's knowledge of a person. When Yah knows a person, it means that Yah gives him special attention and watches over him closely. You can see it in Genesis eighteen nineteen and Psalm 1, 6. Proverbs adds additional dimension to our understanding of knowledge. Proverbs 3, 19 through 20. Yahweh in wisdom founded the earth. He established the heavens with discernment. With his knowledge, depth broke open and clouds dropped dew. Proverbs 24, 3 to 4. By wisdom a house is built, and with discernment it is established. And by knowledge rooms are filled with all riches, precious and pleasant. 
there is a great similarity between these two proverbs. Both proverbs are about building and creation. In the first proverb, the creation of the world, and in the second proverb, the creation of a private house. The two proverbs come to teach us that the main goal of acquiring wisdom is creativity or acts of creation and that in order to, to be creative and produce higher craftsmanship, one must make use of wisdom. In the two proverbs, wisdom and understanding form the content, the context and knowledge fills the context with content. In the first proverb, the context is the earth and the sky, and the content is the water that fills the earth and the sky, abyss and dew. In the second proverb, the context is the building itself, and the content is the precious and, ple and pleasant possessions inside the building. In both proverbs, wisdom is the lower, more basic part of the context, and discernment, reason, is the upper, or more superior part. In the first proverb, wisdom is related to the earth, and discernment, reason, is related to the sky. In the second proverb, wisdom is related to the infrastructure of the house, and discernment, reason, is related to its establishment, that is, its strengthening, stabilization, and finishing. So that's really interesting. Listening to you, I'm looking at this thinking, knowledge just gives the material, the materialism, the materialistic things from knowledge we can do and gain and make and so forth, but it's the wisdom and discernment of how we use that knowledge that we benefit in. And not only that, though, you need wisdom and discernment to establish a home, establish a life, establish your ways with the spiritual side. Mm -hmm. Because without w wisdom and discernment, all you are is just flesh. You're just exactly. knowledge. Exactly. You're, you're, it's just that's material. It. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's yeah. The wisdom and, not, and discernment are the, the spiritual. Mm -hmm. That's how I see the, that one when yeah. I'm looking at this. Yep. Okay. To summarize wisdom, discernment, and knowledge... Just as Yah created the world with wisdom, discernment, and knowledge, as I just mentioned in Proverbs 3, 19 to 20, so did the craftsmen who created the tabernacle were endowed by him with wisdom, discernment, and knowledge. And he has filled him with the Spirit of God, with wisdom, chokhmah, and with discernment, tvuna, and with knowledge, dad, and with every kind of craftsmanship. And so did the chief craftsman who created all the vessels of the first temple, Hiram of Tyre, was endowed by him with wisdom, discernment, and knowledge. 1 Kings 7, 13-14 King Solomon invited and received Hiram from Tyre. He was the son of a widow woman from the tribe of Naphtali, and his father was a man of Tyre, an art of, of copper. <laughs> mm. <laughs> it's driving me nuts, the prawns thing. He was filled with wisdom, chokhmah, and with discernment, vuna, and with knowledge, that. So again, the same words to do all the work with the copper, and he came to King Solomon and he did all of his work. First, one must use wisdom, learn from others. Next, one must use discernment or reason, analyze what one has learned and draw conclusion. And only then does one reach a level of knowledge, a close and intuitive familiarity with the subject matter. So that's summarizing the three, uh, the three gifts, the three talents. I like the summary. Good. Yeah. So before I continue, any thoughts about knowledge or about anything that I shared on the first three talents? All I know after watching and reading and listening to this, we oh, I have a long ways to go. <laughs> That's how I felt, Charlene. <laughs> you yes. Good, I'm glad. 
<laughs> yeah, that's... I, was thinking, I was thinking the exact same thing. <laughs> <laughs> I know. But it's good to do this. And I would literally, really, I want to print it and every now and then meditate on this and see, remind myself where I'm still growing. And it would be good to meditate on and that. Pray that's, that's, and that's pray. Excellent. I wish you would incorporate this in the schools too for children. Yeah. Okay. So the next concept is cunning, and it's so weird that would uh, be under the same umbrella, but it is. So cunning, or ma in Hebrew, the talent to tempt and deceive, and also be aware of deception. In the Bible, cunning has a negative connotation. Genesis 3.1 But if a man schemes against his neighbor to kill him by treachery, you will take him from my altar to die. Exodus 21.14 Go, please, make certain again. Find out and see exactly where he is and who has seen him there. For they have said to me, he is very cunning. Joshua 9.4 And they acted on their part with cunning. They went and prepared provision and took warm out sacks for their donkeys and old wine skin that were torn and mended. First Samuel twenty three twenty two. Go please oh I'm sorry, I did a copy paste and I didn't change the verse. <laughs> okay. Ephesians four fourteen. So that we may no longer be infants tossed about by waves and carried about by every wind of teaching, by the trickery of people, by cunning craftiness with reference to the scheming of the seed. As I said, in the Bible, cunning has a negative connotation, except for in the book of Proverbs. Proverbs introduces a positive aspect of cunning. We will refer to it as positive cunning or shrewdness. This is because Proverbs comes to teach us how to resist temptations and avoid falling into deceptions. And in order for us to be successful at that, we need to be able to recognize them. A clever person in Proverbs knows and understands the art of cunning, but does not actively engage in deceitful acts. Instead, he uses his knowledge to recognize and resist temptation as well as avoid falling into deceptions. Proverbs 1, 2-4 to know wisdom and instruction, to understand saying of discernment, to gain insightful instructions, righteousness and justice and equity, to give cunning or shrewdness to the simple, knowledge and plotting to the young. Proverbs 14.8, the wisdom of the shrewd is understanding his ways, but the folly of fools is deceit. Self-test, am I shrewd? Am I able to detect conspiracies? Proverbs 8.12 I, wisdom, live with cunning, and conspiracies I detect. Meaning, learning never ends. I think because I was doing like copy pasting and then changing things just to maintain the format and I guess I got tired and I didn't Is this one wrong? I didn't change the meaning here but I think it's very self explanatory that wisdom understand and I and identify cunning and conspiracies. When I'm angry, am I able to hide my anger so as not to embarrass myself? Proverbs twelve sixteen a fool's vexation anger is presently known, but a shrewd man conceals his disgrace. Meaning, when the fool gets angry, he is unable to hide it. He shouts and curses, and so his anger be became known to everyone that day. On the other end, when the shrewd gets angry, he knows that the anger is a sign of disgrace for him, so he covers and hides it. Am I able to hide things that I know and not reveal them to those who are not ready to hear them? Hmm. Proverbs 12.23 
A shrewd person conceals knowledge, but the heart of a fool announces folly. Meaning, sometimes in order to arouse a person's desire to learn, it is necessary to, to hide some of the information from him. Do I scrutinize every step someone advises me to take before I take it? Proverbs 14.15 The simple will believe every word, but the shrewd will consider his step. Meaning, a gullible person who is easily tempted to do things is also easily tempted to believe everything they are told without observing and checking in contrast, a shrewd person who knows how to be aware of deception observes the place where he is about to place his foot on to make sure that it is indeed worthwhile to step there. I want to comment on that. I think that's a good point that people follow or listen to a lot of teachers out there and they just will believe everything that they say and that's one of the things that I say in my prayers and say here is for everybody to do the research themselves everybody to validate look for a second witness if I haven't mm -hmm. you know, shared it or shown it and everybody to not believe everything that we share it's our opinion it's our research is what we have uncovered and discovered and sharing and the responsibility is on the listener to look and validate it for themselves for them to apply that in their life if they see what we are sharing mm -hmm. and this is a good point because a lot of people here maybe they like the personality maybe they like something about a teacher and, and they listen and they just believe everything that they, they may say without looking at the other side of it and asking those questions to see if it's mm -hmm. truly valid or not. Yeah, I agree. Okay, do I examine every opinion I hear from all directions before I accept it? Proverbs fourteen eighteen: The simple are adorned with folly, but the shrewd are crowned with knowledge. Meaning, people who are easily seduced readily accept superficial worldviews, hold on to them for life, and are incapable of re-examining them once presented with new data. Shrewd people, on the other hand, examine any information they receive from all directions. They are in control of the flow of information like a king with a crown on his head. Next. Do I learn from the mistakes of others? Proverbs 27, 12. When the shrewd sees danger, he hides. The simple go on and suffer. Meaning, a shrewd person, when he sees something bad happening to someone else, is careful and hides from the source of that evil. Gullible people, however, even though they see bad things happening to other people, they go through and walk the same path themselves and are punished by the same bad thing happening to them too. So I just want to say that when I was doing this self-test for shrewdness, I think probably all of us here in this group are going to score very high on it. We have talent to scrutinizing information and we don't fall easily to deceptions and conspiracies and we are very careful where we put our next steps. So I think according to Proverbs, we, are, we scored high on the positive side of this talent. So we are more careful and we, don't, uh, we are not deceived easily. I think this particular one is somewhat of a sister or hand in hand with discernment. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah. Any thoughts or insights before I continue to number five? I think as far as like the conspiracy side of it, I do think that in, in my opinion, what I've seen over the years with people like this is in the conspiracy world or whatever, but that people can, I think, very easily be deceived by watching or listening to people that are online and think that, they, that they're telling everything that's be so true and everything. And then when you come out against and say, well, have reservations of this, and then they think, oh, it goes to the, to the attacking. But 
that's what deception is. Deception is that it looks exactly like the truth. Yes. And I think that sometimes in this movement, people think, oh, I'll be able to spot them like a mile away because they're deceiving. No, they're literally telling you what you want to hear. They're telling you exactly what the truth is. And with with subtle, small lies in there mm-hmm. or innuendos or steering you in the wrong direction. Yes. And, and this is one thing I think personally myself that woke me up even over during COVID is how vast the alternative media deceptive deceptiveness of that was. And it really woke me up to seeing something so vast, so deceptive, really blew my mind. Yes. And, when you start unraveling that. And I think if anything, that's something that we as believers need to take away from is that deception looks like the truth. And that's why I was saying earlier before the whole thing started is about, we have to just really question and keep our guard on talking about the discernment and discerning what are they saying? What are they speaking? And really bringing that back to the word of Yah and saying, okay, what does this look like? How are they giving the scriptures? Where is the things to back this up? Is there two and three witnesses? And I know you guys know that, but I just wanted to add to that. But thank you. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And that goes back to scrutinizing every step. Yeah. Yeah. Even though you are seeing a deception, but are you going to fall for whatever it may be or not truly see it without scrutinizing? You got to scrutinize it. And I must say, one of the things that I learned in this experience in the last three years is question number three. Am I able to hide things that I know and not reveal them to those who are not ready to hear? Because in my profession, and being a speaker and a a teacher, I want to teach. I love to share everything that I learn. And I learned one of my biggest lessons was to, to use discernment as to whether people are ready to hear what I have to tell them and be careful and just give part of the information and not bombard them and with tons of information and then it's overwhelming and they just they cannot handle it so for me that was point number three was the biggest growth opportunity that i had in the last three years so number five is the word that actually captured the concept of understanding but it it can be depending on the verse it could be it could mean understanding insight common sense and intelligence the word is his skill. The root is sechel, which is it refers to the mind, okay? And the meaning is the talent to make the right choice and succeed, especially in the material realm, okay? Remember before we talked about spiritual realms, those are now we are in the material realm with intelligence. So that's why I said that it's a big salad in the English translation. Like they use the word understanding almost everywhere and uh, indiscriminately. And it's really not what the Hebrew says. So now let's see what the Hebrew says about understanding. In the biblical language, understanding, insight, common sense refers to success that results from right thinking or to right thinking that leads to success. This word also appears in verses that talk about practical success, such as Deuteronomy 29.9, and you must diligently observe the words of this covenant so that you may have understanding and succeed in all that you do. Joshua 1 7 only be strong and very courageous to observe diligently the whole law that Moses my servant commanded you do not turn aside from it to the right or left so that you may have understanding and succeed wherever you go 1 Samuel 18 5 David went out whenever Saul sent him and he had understanding and succeeded so Saul appointed him over the men of the war and it pleased all the people and even pleased the servants of Saul Isaiah 52 13 look my servant shall be insightful he shall be exalted and he shall be lifted up and he shall be very high 
it, so this concept also appears in verses that describe wisdom and discernment such as Deuteronomy 32 29 if only they were wise they would understand this they would discern for themselves their end Isaiah 41 20 so that they may see and know and take the heart and understand together that the hand of Yahweh has done this and the Holy One of Israel has created it. Hence, the concept of understanding intelligence denotes a practical talent to do the most useful thing in the most useful way. So there is a short self-test on intelligence, understanding, common sense four questions do i try to progress and improve incessantly proverbs 15 24 the path of life leads upward from him who has understanding in order to turn away from sheol below meaning the person with understanding as a lifestyle of progress and a constant upward climb so that he is spared and saved from going down to the underworld to degeneration and spiritual death. Do I hoard and save from periods of abundance for periods of scarcity? Proverbs 10.5 he who gathers in the summer is an insightful son. He who sleeps at the harvest is a son who brings shame. Meaning, a man who has understanding or quote-unquote brains knows that in times of abundance he should store up so that he will have enough left for the period of scarcity that will follow. An insightful son hoards in the summer. A person who has no insight sees that there is abundance and thinks that the abundance will last forever and therefore does not bother to store it up. He prefers to sleep. He falls asleep in the harvest. And then the next question for leaders or managers. Do I manage to maintain cohesion in my team and make sure that my people don't scatter everywhere? Jeremiah 10, 21. For the shepherds have become stupid. They do not seek Yahweh. Therefore, they do not have insight. And all of their flocks flock are scattered. Meaning, Sometimes, in order to arouse a person's desire to learn, it is necessary. Did I do this again? I did it again. <laughs> okay. Anyway, this verse again is self-explanatory. Next, do I speak in a way that promotes my listeners to open up and receive my message more readily? Proverbs thirteen fifteen. Common sense grants favor, but the way of the faithless is coarse. Meaning, what words that are spoken with common sense, words speak to the value system of the listener, will enable the speaker to please and convince the listener. However, there are people who will not be influenced even by the words of common sense, people of treacherous nature who hold a firm grip on their evil ways. So that's about intelligence. Next concept is conspiracy or plot, mezima. That refers to the talent to harm. A conspiracy is a premeditated and elaborate plan aimed at causing harm to others. In most places in the Bible, the term conspiracy describes a premeditated and elaborate plan of the wicked to harm the weak. For example, Proverbs 24, 8, He who plans to do evil, he shall be called master of conspiracy. Psalms 10 to 4, In arrogance, the wicked persecute the poor. Let them be caught in the plots that they devised. Psalms 21, 11, Though they have plotted evil against you, though they have planned a conspiracy, they will not prevail. 
In several places, the plot is an in-depth plan of fiat to bring calamity on the enemies of Israel, such as in Jeremiah 23:20, the anger of Yahweh will not turn back until he's doing and until he's keeping the plots of his mind. Jeremiah 30:24, the burning anger of Yahweh will not turn back until he's doing and until he's accomplishing the plots of his mind. In the last of the days you will understand it. As with the concept of cunning, Proverbs introduces a positive aspect of plot or plotting. This is because Proverbs comes to teach us how to identify conspiracies and avoid being avoid being trapped by them. And in order for us to be successful at that, we need to be able to recognize them. So it's exactly like with cunning, okay? So it goes hand in hand, cunning and plotting or conspiracy. Both of them, Proverbs teaches the positive aspect, which means we need to understand how to plot or how to be shrewd in order for us to avoid falling in the pitfall of someone deceiving us. So a clever person in Proverbs knows and understands the art of plotting, but does not actively engage in plotting to harm other human beings. Instead, he uses his knowledge to recognize and avoid the pitfalls of conspiracies. So again, the same verse that they use for cunning, we use here Proverbs 1, 2 to 4, to know wisdom and instruction, to understand saying of discernment, to gain insightful instruction, righteousness and justice and equity, to give shrewdness to the simple, knowledge and plotting to the young. And then Proverbs 2, 10 through 12, for wisdom will enter your heart and knowledge will be pleasing to your soul. Plot will watch over you. Discernment will protect you in order to deliver you from the way of evil from a man who speaks devious things. I, I think it really makes sense with everything we've been going through. We can see that conspiracy is the intent to harm other people, especially weaker people than you. And as I said in, in Proverbs, we just need to learn to identify it so we don't fall for it. And then the last concept is resourcefulness or ingenuity. In Hebrew, it's tushia, the talent to plan and deliver help. So resourcefulness is a program that aims to help and benefit others. The word resourcefulness appears in the Bible in two contexts. One, as a synonym for the concepts of advice, wisdom, and thought, and two, as a synonym for the concept of help and protection. Proverbs 3, 19 to 21, Yahweh in wisdom founded the earth. He established the sky with discernment, with his knowledge depths broke open and clouds drop do my child may they not escape from your sight may you keep sound resourcefulness and plotting okay that's the next verse proverbs 8 14 advice and resourcefulness are mine i am discernment strength is mine isaiah 28 29 this also comes forth from yahweh of hosts he is wonderful in advice is great in resourcefulness. And then Proverbs 2, 7, for the upright is stores resourcefulness, a shield for those who walk uprightly. And last, Job 6, 13, indeed my help is not in me and any resourcefulness is driven from me. Hence, the general meaning of resourcefulness is plans and thoughts aimed at helping and benefiting. The antonym of resourcefulness is conspiracy, which means plans and thoughts aimed at harming and damaging. That's it for tonight. Any comments about the resourcefulness or before I talked about conspiracy? Any thoughts or insight about those two? Okay, I am going to just discuss the tickers 
this uh, week was a disaster because the two of the three chapters did not match at all between the LXX and Masoretic. Everything was a, a big mess, out of order, but I think the meaning was there except it was out of order completely. And also as far as the Dead Sea Scrolls, a lot of the text was missing this week. I did find some variants between Masoretic and LXX and I marked it, but it wasn't a major variant because the meaning was still there. And that's it. Yes, Father, thank you. Thank you for this time that we've had and for sharing your words and being able to research and study and have them for us to learn, to dig into, to uncover and to discover your ways. May we continue to walk in your ways. May we continue to share your ways and your truth to others. May others be seekers of truth so that they may come to you and gain knowledge and wisdom, understanding. And Father, may they be blessed. We ask these things in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.